at what point does the brand step in and go, right, we're opening a lawsuit against you because... Matt Armstrong. Over one and a half million subscribers on YouTube. 240 million views. Seriously, Matt, you, sir, are a knob. Do you find yourself chasing numbers? It's a bit weird for me. I speak to a camera better than I speak to people. I only see the numbers on the screen and it really doesn't mean much to me. But I was still working two jobs. Every video was doing over 100,000 views. Monday to Friday, nine till five at my main job. Finishing work there, driving straight to the restaurant and then getting changed at the restaurant and working six till 10 in the restaurant. It was just purely just work, 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 work. But what do you think is the biggest risk posed to you as a YouTuber? I don't know if I've gone into this before, actually. My whole channel is really about cheating the dealers. We found like a Ford Focus indicator fits on a Lamborghini. So have you ever had a car so far that's nearly broke you? You buy a car from an auction site, there is a chance that it's been in an auction before that. Took like a massive loss on it, but it is what it is. Everyone I've employed at the minute has all been family, all been friends. You ever had that go wrong? Uh... Do you believe you will be the biggest automotive YouTuber in the world? I think... Matt, my favourite podcasts are always the one where I've either followed the guest for years or slightly known them and had a relationship. And I believe that you may have even followed me going back before you even started the channel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just amazing to see what your journey has turned out like. And it's so inspiring to not just me, but many others. However, I'm sure that most of the people that are watching this already are well clued up on who you are. But in your own words, who are you and how would you describe yourself? Um, Matt Armstrong. I rebuild crash damaged cars, cheap cars, cars with a bit of history and film it all for YouTube. And it's safe to say that by doing that, it has rather rocketed off with numbers that are just quite frankly insane. Over one and a half million subscribers on YouTube, 240 million views <laughs> and 264,000 Instagram followers. So when I say that, how does that make you feel? It's a bit weird for me because I only see the numbers on the screen and really it doesn't mean loads, like much to me with the numbers. But when... I go to like shows and things like that. And there's people coming up asking for photos. That's when it's like, well, that's weird. Like, <laughs> but, And you just come back from Goodwood Festival of Speed, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely nuts. I was supposed to be there on the Saturday. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we won't go into that. No, that's it. That's it. So, but that must have felt even crazier as each year goes by. And do you ever find yourself feeling in awkward positions with that? Does it get on top of you or, yeah. or have you just learned to soak it up? I think... The people situation is hard to deal with. I speak to a camera better than I speak to people now. Uh, but I think it always has been that. But the I think as the following builds up, people think you're like some kind of celebrity or something when really it's just like a normal person as you and me know who's just cracked on doing his normal everyday stuff and filming it for YouTube. But then there's loads and loads of people watching it. And then you get people walking down the street who feel like they know you. So they're like, say hello to my dog and that. And then it qu makes me question, do I know this person or have they just been following me? And it really kind of confuses you a bit. That's quite hard to deal with like that type of stuff. But um, other than that, it's been amazing. But I guess with all these other celebrities and stuff, they have kind of like media coaching and like that type of stuff with YouTube. It's just, you're Pick out Pick up there. the camera you're and start there. rolling. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So what made you get on the path of rebuilding the crash damage to because, because before that you were really well established and building up a massive following really for BMX riding. Yeah. So that must have been when you thought, what is it that could get me my fame or could take off? You'd have thought that that person in the street was recognizing the dog because you're BMX <laughs> riding. It, but it has, it. It, at the minute, the main following is from what you've just stated. So yeah, it was, I was always filming stuff on YouTube for BMX and you had to, put in um, kind of sponsorship videos or if you were going to a competition, you had to film a video of doing like all your tricks and stuff to send to competitions, see if you were good enough to get in. And if they were, then it's all good. And then also people used to share your videos around and that type of stuff as well. And then everybody used to get like millions of views or like probably like 5,000, 10,000, if that. And, uh, and then from, I think I was always into cars. Everyone who's 
into BMX and always kind of has that natural progression into cars. They fiddle around with the bikes then they fiddle around with the car when they get one. And I think it's just kind of progressed from there. And my girlfriend crashed her Audi TT and it kind of, the story with rebuilding cars started from that really. And do you know what's crazy is on your friends with uh, Ricky from RE Performance. Yeah. And on that um, road, that was when I first found out actually how much of a hype around BMX in there was because there's a, a shop ATB yeah. uh, road, which is famous for skaters and scooters and all kinds yeah, of things yeah. like that. And I met a couple of the lads that had come all the way over to the US to do an event and the road all the way down to the bottom was just full. And it was like, yeah. whoa, there's this whole other world here. That's it. That's um, it. But you don't include that really in the channel at the minute, do you? No, I mean, there's... A- there's a following for BMXing, but as you can imagine, the BMX following is much more of a smaller circle than uh, automotive following. And we found that out with YouTube. You'd upload stuff. And unless you were doing like an absolute world's first trick, you wouldn't get any traction on like a video or anything like that. And even then, people who are doing like crazy, crazy tricks, it's not as many views as what I'm doing rebuilding a car. But it was never... That was never kind of the goal or the way I was going out to film these videos. I was never filming it to get like millions of views or this, that, and the other. It was just, I was trying to be a good BMX. So I was trying to be professional, be a professional BMX and money doing it. And as years go on, you realize there's like not much money in BMX riding at all. I mean, so if you win one of the biggest competitions of the year, you come away with probably like seven to 10,000 euros. And then it gives you enough to, Get to the next competition. Really like, that. I come from the background of art form. Yeah. I used to be professional angle. And in that world, there's just a huge following for it. Yeah. But like, again, the prize money, people just compare it to golf. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. This, how the hell has this guy got a lap and an Enzo? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> it. That's it. it. It's the following, I think, is what makes it. And I don't know why it's like that. Maybe it'll pick up. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But uh, mountain biking always had a little bit more money than BMX riding, but it never did. And then I think a lot of it's ruined by, as you get older, you want more money. You need a mortgage. You need to kind of secure something down so you can get paid. And then all these, the bigger riders come up are like young. They're like 16, 17, and they're happy with a free bike or they're happy with like a, a, a load of gear, which would take them to... Um, all these different competitions, they're happy to pay their travel expenses. And then when you're saying, oh, I need £2,000 a month and then travel expenses and a bike and everything on top, they're saying, well, this lad, 16-year-old lad is beating you at competitions and he only wants a bike and that's what ruins it. So it it's the younger kids undercutting everyone and it kind of spoils the industry a bit. Do you still use that as a release? Yeah, I was still like, I still go and ride every so often when I get time. I took my BMX to America when we rebuilt the GT3. Uh, but yeah, I can't, it's, it's now I ride for a different reason. It's more before I used to, if I wasn't scaring myself or learning a new trick, I didn't enjoy it. But now it's, I can go out and if I've rode around the skate park and I've not fell off, then I've enjoyed it. <laughs> and you're probably not thinking about rebuilding whatever yeah, car that, and part hasn't turned up it. at that specific time. That's it. And one of your first rebuilds you just mentioned was your girlfriend's crashed Audi TT. Yeah. Um, as we know, we love to talk about the fact of making businesses on this podcast and how a business evolves. Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know, how the hell did you fund that first project? You bought the car back off the insurers, right? Yeah. So I don't know if I've gone into this before, actually, but the, um, so I had a Mercedes E350 at the time and it cost me, I think, £11,000 at the time I had that car. And it was like, it was like, that was like my pride and joy car, really. But my sort of escape from the matrix was going to be to buy houses, do them up and resell them. It's something that you don't need any qualifications to do. Anyone could, anyone could do it. All you need is the original, the money to start with to be able to do that. So that was like, right, this is how I'm going to escape of doing a nine to five job, doing building these houses up and I can go and ride my bike and do what I enjoy doing in the in my spare time because you're kind of making passive income as such through the houses. So uh, I was working nine to five. I was working six till 10 in the evenings at the restaurant. So I was doing like way, like the shifts were unreal, going Monday to Friday, nine till five at my main job, finishing work there, driving straight to the restaurant and then getting changed at the restaurant and working six to 10 in the restaurant, saved up a lot of money through there because I'm not um, going out. I'm not drinking or anything like that. It was just purely just work, 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 work. And that's how I afforded up the Mercedes as well. And my girlfriend crashed her Audi TT 
And when she crashed that, she, I asked, I, I didn't think it looked that bad. And I was shocked when the insurance wrote it off and said, oh, it's a write-off. We're not going to repair it. As I've learned more, I've realized why they write these cars off the age and it's not on, it not economy. How would you Economically say? friendly Economically to that. To, yeah. And to buy it back, I think it was like £400 or £500 to buy the car back. Like, from the insurance, I was You're like, like oh, I'm going to make some money. Here, I pump could sell it the seats house. for that. Yeah, could, yeah. So that was it. I was like, well, this is a perfect opportunity. Hannah got paid out four thousand two hundred pound or something from the insurance as a payout. So she got to buy a BMW One Series, a, a new car, and I bought the a TT back from the insurance of four hundred pound, and it was a win win. So from Hannah there. was sorted in there. Yeah, so Hannah so you was that's got the TT. Yeah, Hannah was sorted. <laughs> I got this Audi TT, and then I thought, well, I'm going to rebuild it. And I looked at all the parts to rebuild it, checked all on eBay and stuff. And the parts were cheap for them. There's millions of Audi TTs out there to get parts for and got a load of parts on there. I can't remember how much it actually cost me to repair, like probably a little bit over a thousand pound, if that. Really? It was really, really cheap. Filmed it all on YouTube as well. And then after I rebuilt the TT, that was my main car. And then I sold my um, E-Class. I think I sold my E-Class for like 9,000 pounds. And that was my deposit on the next house. So it was it, it, I, juggling I to, the cars and yeah, houses. Yeah, so I sold that. I sold that, and I never thought that YouTube was going to be a thing, of income or anything like that. It was just oh, I sold the E class, pulled out nine thousand pound out of that. That's going to be another deposit on another house, and I've got an Audi TT which you can drive around now, which is a half decent car. So it works perfectly. So were you looking at the houses as? future security or were you looking at the houses as a way to build that as your entire That was foundation? going to be my full income. Yeah. The houses were going to be my full income. I did really well off the first one. I think I bought the house for like people will be like, oh, you can't buy houses for that much now, but I bought it for 102,000. When I watched the, the video that you're referring to, yeah. I, I sat back and thought, oh, his comments are going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was 102,000, the first one. We spent literally like five to eight grand on it really cheap, but we did all the work ourselves. We, um, Bought a kitchen from eBay, from Facebook Marketplace, a full kitchen, including like the oven, the hob, the fridge, the freezer, dishwasher, everything for 200 quid because the they, they needed it gone because they were having an extension and the, it was going to cost them money to get it removed. So we just went in there, removed it ourselves and then fitted it into ours. So we got absolute bargain. That there. is a stroke of luck. And then, um, yeah, we and then I found out about like the buy uh, rent, refinance sort yeah, of thing buy. yeah yeah so we uh i bought that and we did up the house and i was going to sell it and then i learned about if i sold it i was going to have to pay capital gains tax the house was worth two hundred and forty thousand after i um renovated it and then one of my friends had his house rented out and he says he's moving back into his house do he, does he want do i want his tenants they're really good he just wants to go back into the house i was like i'll give it a go they went into my house and they've been paying rent and they've been absolutely mint since. Like it's been. And they're still in the original it, house. Yeah, they've been in the house and it's, uh, yeah, I refinanced the house, pulled the money out, went onto the next property with the money I've pulled out from that and, yeah, so on and so forth. It carried on. Do you think that if you hadn't have gone, what has happened with the YouTube channel? Yeah. And property had have been where you'd have been at, sat here right now with interest rates the highest we'd have ever known in our lives. How do you think you'd be coping? Um, do you know what? Still, they're doing it. The houses still make money. Like I've still got all the houses. They still make money. Like interest rates will have to go really, really high for me not to be able to make a profit. But they are changing a lot of things with like the way, like before, you used to be able, used to, be able to do mortgage and interest rate as a tax deductible item off the house. So you could rent the house out for 600 quid and your mortgage could be 500 quid, but that's a, tax deductible item and you're still paying off the mortgage and that's tax deductible. Then they took the mortgage side of it off as a tax deductible thing and only the interest was tax deductible. So that's when I changed all the stuff into interest only. And then now they've changed that. So it's 600 pound is that that's the like if the rent 600 pound, you're having to pay tax on that full amount. There's no tax deductible items apart from if there's any repairs I'm or maintenance. I'm learning on about it now. Luckily, it's I've the nuts. thing that I think I've done right with my properties, I've got them all in one property company. Yeah. So they're easy to manage. That's what owns them. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you've got them in a company, it's a lot It's a lot better. You, then there are tax deductible things like your interest can be deducted off a limited company. 
But this ba- if I get into this, I'm back. There's going to be there's bound to be going to be loads of things I'll say wrong, and it's like, that's not right. But <laughs> should, yeah, should we get back that, to the car? That, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, there's I think I think yeah, I w- I, there's ways around it to make money through it. Like it, whether interest rates goes up, there's other routes you can take. I mean, now massively, Airbnbs are, are huge now. Like in holiday lets, you're getting much better rates on like holiday lets, and you can make much better return on investments on holiday lets and stuff like that. So I would have always found a way around it. I'm pretty sure of if, if how that's how I would have done it. From everything that you seem to have said that you do, whether it's property or with the cars, or with the YouTube channel, it always seems like you just start out by having that go, yeah. having a go at it. And it doesn't seem like there's much of a business plan or a plan No, no, there. it's literally just... You just, just roll with everything. I think it's... I think if I'm into, interested in something, I will just do it 100%. And that's the best way to go about it. When you do things like... 50% here, 50% there. I mean, you're not going to get, you're going to get 50% back out and 50% back out of there. Like it's the same with the, like with the properties at the minute, they don't really, they tick over, but I know that I could make a lot more money through the property stuff. But I'm, if you were doing hundred percent, yeah, it. I'm not doing it hundred percent. It's not my main thing. Like, to be honest, I would have sold them, but I would have sold them by now to concentrate purely on the YouTube stuff. But the tenants are so good. I'm not going to sell the house. I just, let them let like they love the houses and stuff like that. I'm not going to leave them homeless or anything like that or have have them move out. They they work brilliantly there, and I just let them tick over. We I just let the rent cover like the bills and that type of stuff. Keep and an eye on it every now and yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, like that's it. And it's it, the equity is already there, but I I I don't want to take my mind off YouTube because that's my main thing. As and soon as you go off, started. It seems like the property company started next to when that TT or what bill was going. So do you yeah. remember? When you finish that TT build, do you remember where you were at in terms of following? Um, or what with the TT did? build, I I had I think under ten thousand subscribers when I finished the TT build, and then we moved on. To, and I remember there thinking, oh, I was really enjoying this YouTube stuff. It's only like forty pound a month or something like that, and I was like, it's paying gym membership or whatever. It was the. It, it was, it's, I didn't YouTube think, money. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't even think like you could get paid that much off YouTube anyway. I just thought that it, I didn't realize that you could do that. I didn't think it was a thing. So like, it was never going to be like a full-time job for me. I didn't think it was. So doing it purely possible. out of passion. Yeah. So I was just doing it, rebuilding it, but then I really enjoyed it. And there was like a little community that sort of like with people were talking in the comments and they're helping me out. And I was like, oh, I want to do another one. So I kind of jumped onto, uh, Hannah's one series and started modifying it and those videos started doing really well and I was like oh this is really good and then it's it then became people were messaging me saying I think I got up to like 10 like 20,000 subscribers or something like that and then like I had like sponsorships messaging me saying oh we want to mention this in your video or something like that I was like oh, okay yeah just give me 50 quid and I'll do it and I, I had no idea like, I just thought yeah that, that'll do and then that was another little passive income I had on the side just making videos which I was doing for fun and getting paid at the end of the month for them I didn't really think it was like a business plan or anything like that I just kind of went with the flow with it all when did you think it was a business plan when I I remember okay it was Christmas time and it was it was the Christmas before COVID and 19 yeah, so I just bought and I thought oh, I'm going to go at it again. And this time I'm going to buy, I sold the Audi TT and I thought I'm going to buy a car specific for YouTube. And I've never done that before. I never like specifically bought a car for YouTube. I always bought it with common sense, not like <laughs> this is going to work really well. It was, <laughs> so uh, I bought an Audi S5, the cheapest Audi S5 I could find. It was five grand. And I posted the video, must have been around New Year's time. And the video just blew up like it went mental like it, it got like a hundred thousand views in like a couple of days and then all my other videos on the channel all started just going mental i think people, people found that more. video yeah and then they watched the other ones it was like oh this is quite cool it's like my channel got found and then it it that month i think that january month i must have earned i think about three thousand pounds of ad revenue and i was like oh my god if you could do this every month that it's a full-time job. I was like, is it a one-off? Is it? I don't know. And from then on, every video was doing over a hundred thousand views. And, but I was still working two jobs as well. And like kind of going in. And like, let me get this right. You were doing that. Was that on by that point on a driveway or was that in the yeah, car park or, of an or, Indian restaurant? Yeah, yeah. A bit of both, a bit of both. Yeah. Like, so like the lads would let me use the car park and I was doing it a bit on my driveway as well. Like, but yeah, it was all, it, 
that's, I think I, I then left the Indian restaurant, I think at that point. Uh, and I thought if I had a bit more time in the evenings, I could film uh, the videos in the evenings and make what I make at the Indian restaurant and probably and and some by doing that. I didn't not enjoy working at the Indian restaurant. Like it was like just going down the pub with your mates, that, that job, it was absolutely mint, but yeah, it was, that was like my first kind of leap for, right, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it doing this. And I think it, that worked out and as the more time I put into it, the more I got out of it. And I think then it was building up. I think February, I didn't earn as much as January because everything blew up in January. And then I think COVID hit, was it March, yeah. April time? As soon as COVID happened, that was, I got furloughed from work and sent home. And the, literally the only thing I could do was film YouTube videos. It's like the ideal recipe. Yeah. It, it, if, I, if it wasn't for COVID, I wouldn't have been where I'm at today. There's no, I don't think I would have been, I wouldn't be able to do that leap of faith from the full-time job. Nothing would have pushed me over. It's, but It's a common theme though, that there's some yeah. external event that people don't see happening. That when you bring people onto this podcast or I listen to ones that I enjoy, there's some kind of wave moment that just picks somebody up and takes it occasionally. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Ben Francis at Gymshark collided with the start of Instagram in 2011. Yeah. Bang, on yeah, the wave. And that's it's, it. It's not to say that you haven't worked hard. It's not to say that you haven't done this, but if you can just collide with a little moment randomly. Yeah, I think, it, and it's like opportunities that, like the universe puts out to you these opportunities and people miss them. They're like, it, I feel like that I was forced into that place. I remember it in the office at my work, the boss came in and he goes, look, we've got to furlough some people because like, if we're not seen to doing it, it looks like we're not abiding by the rules kind of thing. So like, who wants to be furloughed? And everyone sat there like, well, I don't know. And I was like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do, I'll, I'll be furloughed. I'll do whatever. And uh, so a few of the lads got furloughed and a few of the lads um, stayed there. I went home and I think, what the hell am I going to do that? But the weather was amazing. And that's when, I had saved up uh, enough money to go and buy another house. And I was thinking, right, what I'll do, I'll buy another property and during my furlough thing, I'll, I'll do it up and go from there. But also at the same time during COVID, every, no one knew what their property prices would do. Would they go up? Would they go down? Interest rate go up, down, left, right? No one knew. So I was, at the time, I was making a couple of thousand pounds from uh, YouTube each month. And I thought, well, why don't I just go out and buy... Another car. Did you hit 100k by then? I think I did hit 100k by that then. That seems yeah. like that would be about. The- it was around that time, I'm sure. And then uh, I saw a Bentley Continental GT for like 10,000 um, pounds. Won won it at auction, bought it, and we filmed like the whole rebuild on the driveway. And it it was literally like that. That felt those kind of five weeks. I think I was furloughed was like the best five weeks of my whole life. You know, I felt like that was. I'd fell into something that I really enjoyed doing and got a taste of what it's like to enjoy your work. Like it literally every hundred, if you put hundred percent in, I'm getting hundred percent back out of it. We're putting loads of effort into these videos and they're doing really well. I'm earning money from it. I'm enjoying it. And it, it was just amazing. It was really good. I didn't, at the time I wasn't riding my BMX cause I didn't want to injure myself and get put in hospital and get COVID that type of stuff. So like I was, lip purely just working on cars and it it just completely took off from there and that's when then sponsorships come in and they were saying to me about i was still charging like 50 pound a sponsorship at like that point and then like an agency contacted me and say oh this brand wants to sponsor your videos how much do you charge 50 quid 10 pound whatever and then they're like oh you should be charging like two thousand pound for that and i'm like what? But really like two grand for like 60 seconds of a video. And they're like, yeah, that's what you charge. Like that's how many people are seeing your video. It's valuable to them. So as soon as I realized that and I was called back into work. You're living off adrenaline at that point. Yeah. I was just, I I couldn't believe that's what it, because you're so used to trading your time for money. I think when you're working nine to five, you're thinking I'm getting paid 10 pound every hour I'm here or something like that. And when someone goes, Oh, I'm going to pay you two, Two thousand pounds for sixty seconds of a video. It, you think this is mental? It doesn't make sense. It's like money that you don't think is even possible to be made through that much. But the more I think about it, the more valuable it is, and the more it obviously it, it clearly work. It clearly works for these companies because they keep coming back to spend more and more money. So it obviously works. And but I did not realize that's how much money. Do you was think involved. in the last three years you've understood the va- value of that now? Yeah, hundred percent now, like hundred percent. And there's a lot of people which still undercharge, including myself on a lot of things. Like we, it when we 
it opens our eyes when we see like TV advertisements, how much people are charging to advertise during like football games or on Sky Sports or during F1. And we think, oh my God, it's so expensive. And you, like it's being showed to this many million pe- people. And we're like, oh my God, I do like a million views in like 24 hours or something. And like we're charging like 10% of that price that these guys are charging. It's nuts, but there's a lot of corporations which haven't opened up the doors to YouTube yet. It's like an older, the younger generation get it, but it's the older generation of like, well, we didn't want to sponsor a YouTuber. We don't really get that yet, but it will grow as the younger generation work. So you, you actually, you, you believe YouTube has still got a long way to go. Oh, and yeah. We're just about to go into a new phase of it. Oh, 100%. Yeah, a lot of people, were, that's what, when I was quitting my job to do YouTube and I spoke to my mum, I said, I'm going to quit my job and go for it full time doing YouTube. My mum was like, you've got a really good job. Like you could be set for life for this job. Like I wouldn't do it. It's too much of a risk. My dad's like, yeah, do it. <laughs> so my dad didn't understand any and of it. Why do you think your dad said, yeah, do it and your mum didn't? My dad's always been like self-employed, work for himself. My mum's always been work nine till five, um, get like a secure job, that type of thing. So it was like a, a balance of like, oh my God, is my mum right? Is Devil my dad on right? one shoulder and the angel yeah, on the other. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. But I'm so glad I like, took the risk to do it. But I do think that the more I look at it, YouTube is, I mean, it, it's only kind of beginning. I think uh, everyone now, kids now, all they do is watch YouTube. They watch Netflix. Who watches normal TV? And like these people that are now watching YouTube, when, they, when they're working their way up through their corporate jobs and they become CEOs and they become managers, they've grew up watching YouTubers and, they've grew up with that YouTuber. They're more likely to be open to sponsoring a YouTube video. They're more likely to be open to working with a YouTuber. Whereas now these big corporate companies have no idea about YouTube. No, you're just a YouTube channel and a yeah, little unit. Yeah. That's it. They don't, under- they don't understand the value of it at the minute, but as soon as it rises up, it's going it, to, it's going to be bigger than it would ever be. Like it, and I believe that hundred percent it's, it's just keeping it going. <laughs> So we just quickly had a little break to get some fresh air because unlike your build, I didn't go quite to the max on this and forgot (laughs) the air con. So we actually have to have a breather in this van. Um, But what I'd like to get back into is in the unit just behind us, luckily we're in the shade, you are now working on an F430 Ferrari, which is your latest project. Yeah. And the first time you've actually done a Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, What other brands have you done up to Ferrari? Um, I've done Lamborghini, Bentley, Aston Martin, Audi, BMW. Uh, we've done Toyota. Uh, that's it, I think. Maybe. But yes. And do you want to cover a lot more? Yeah. So what I now buy the builds based on the repair I want to do, rather than the car, if that makes sense. So if a car's got if a car's got a story behind it, I'm I'm willing to go for it. The GT3 had an amazing story behind it. I never thought I'd own a 992 GT3 because, in America yeah and then in America that was that was just like the most craziest thing it was like a last minute let's just do it and again like I was saying earlier with how the universe puts like an opportunity out for you to do something that was my next opportunity it just fell so perfectly right we just got rid of one car and uh, was looking for another build this GT3 came up on Copart I just met Freddie Tavares a month before and he said if I ever want to build a car in Florida, come and do it. I was like, okay, I'll keep my eye out. Next thing, Adam LZ's GT3 got put on Copart. It was like, I had to buy it. No, doesn't matter what it went for, I had to buy it. You knew that was, you were buying that car. Yeah, that was literally put in front of my face for a reason. But yeah, now I'll look for a car with, okay, so we've done front tub damage on the Porsche. We've done um, like some structural damage on a BMW. Now with the Ferrari, it's like a full engine rebuild. So it's like a separate something that I've not really touched on. We did the Mercia Largo and then like I I wanted to do another kind of engine rebuild uh, series as well. Like really interested in doing that because I don't really know too much about like the engine building. My dad does. I prefer the more bodywork repair and the structural repair type of stuff. So uh, one build that we haven't released yet has got huge rear quarter damage, like massive. The car's like a banana. So it's going to require like going on a, a jig to be pulled out and everything like that. So more stuff that I haven't touched on, but I'm really interested in learning it. But as, as I'm learning, the viewers are learning it as well. And uh, I think that's what people enjoy about it. They see like, I ain't got a clue, but <laughs> the, the viewers as well are, are also learning as well. That's the bit here. How much have you learned? How much more do you reckon there is to 
Oh, there's so much. There's so- do you still feel like a novice or do you feel like, no, I know what I'm doing now? Uh, I know a lot more than I did. I know, I know a lot more than I did. And you don't realise that until you come across, until I see a car now crash. Like, I remember a perfect example. Sorry, my friend crashed his Audi A5 and it looked, at the time, before I was doing crash damage cars, it looked absolutely ruined. Like airbags are gone and front end. And I thought there's no way anyone's repairing that. And we see in his car, like about six months later on the road, thinking how the hell has someone repaired that car? But now looking at it and looking at the photos of when he crashed it now, I'm like, oh, that's an easy repair. It's quite, but so like it's opened my eyes up now to, I can see a crash damaged car on the side of the road and, th- and think, oh, that's an easy repair. I could do that. So I would say my knowledge has increased a lot more there, but, yeah, cars are forever changing and there's technology's changing on them. Like even bleeding the brakes on a BMW M5 is I not that. the same as bleeding the brakes on an older car. It, there's so much electronics involved and something like that is now, if I ever had to do another BMW, I'd know about that be, just from experience rather than uh, like looking it up or it's experience, which is more valuable than anything else, I'd say. So have you ever had a car so far that's nearly broke you? The, we bought a C63 um, a while back and the chassis leg had like been pushed back about an inch. And now I'd go for it and repair that type of car. Like the engine would, like I'd take the engine out and put it on a jig and go for it. I, I would, But at that time I was nowhere near that point and it would have had to been, all the work would have probably had to been outsourced. And that car, I think, if I remember rightly, I think I bought it for like 14 grand or around that um, it crash damage and it had been doctored up as well. So car was in a much worse accident than what I thought. And again, now it's it's experience that comes with it. There's people out there that do that. So if you buy a car from an auction site, which is crash damage, there is a chance that it's been in an auction before that. Someone's looked at it and gone, oh my God, I, it's not worth repairing. And then they put a bonnet on it, a bumper on it, and like a headlight, you know, to make it look like it's not been in that bad of an accident, which this C63 had, put it back through auction. And then someone like me goes and buys it and think, oh, it's just had a front end knock and it'd be fine. Then you start taking off the bumper and stuff and think, oh my God, someone's doctored this up. And yeah, that one was really bad. And I, I didn't know what to do at the time. And at the time, because we filmed everything, I was like, I can't put it back through auction because that's exactly what's happened to me. I didn't want to... Um, do the exact same thing that's happened to me. I I sold it for like eight grand. Uh, took like a massive loss on it, but it it is what it is. We filmed the videos you win on some, it. You lose some. Yeah, that's it. And it was bound to happen. I was bound to get bit at some point taking these risks on the car. But yeah, it, it's but it's all a learning curve. Now I know about that. Now I know to check. So yeah, that would be the perfect example, really. Now, James May famously called you a idiot for <laughs> your Maserati Gran Turismo build. So would you say that is the most controversial build that you've done so far? What's got you the most heat? Yeah, I'd say the Maserati is. Yeah, that was, again, something I'd always wanted to do. And I think anyone who's watching or listening, they're so put off by modifying the car their way because somebody will tell them, oh, that's horrible. But why, why do you care about that? Like, I, like if you enjoy it, you might as well you might as well do it. But who cares what the next person thinks? But I've always wanted to do like a Liberty Walk wide body on a car. And I seen the Maserati, I seen one that was done in Europe somewhere. That looks amazing. And then I was checking all the prices of Maseratis all the time. I found one which was really cheap, but the cheapest one, chopped it up and did it. And yeah, that was it, that's a nuts build, and I've kept it today still to this day. But yeah, that was uh it's it's one that a lot of people like to talk in the comments about, but some people love it, some people hate it. But when everyone sees it in person, everyone loves yeah. it. Everyone's having photos of it and thinking, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's it's different, isn't it? It's different, but you've got to do stuff like that as well for to stand out. So now this is a question I really wanted to ask. I remember watching your early videos and I saw the, ve- the famous chalkboard at the back of the room. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be so many people watching your videos that, that must have the thought in the back of their head if I just buy one of these crash damaged cars at Copa <laughs> and I get it for the right price and I can go on eBay and get my parts, I can make a business out of this. Do you believe that that is possible? And do you believe that is wise? With the, white, with the right car and the knowledge as well, 
you could make money off it. It is difficult. It's really difficult, especially now because everyone's doing it. During summer, all the prices of cars on Copart or, or any auction places, they're way higher because these driveway mechanics are giving it a go themselves. And it is really hard to make money, but there is, there's people doing it full time. There is ways of doing it, but I would definitely, if you're kind of a novice and you're starting off, you want to start off with a car that you know, uh, that you know kind of more inside out, like the Audi TT that uh, I rebuilt with ha- with Hannah. I knew that car like inside out, we'd worked on it before and I knew it was like a, a Volkswagen Golf underneath everything. So we knew it and we knew what the parts were worth and everything like that. But yeah, it's a, it is a risk, but yeah, it's it's a gamble with everything you do. There is money to be made, but you've got to buy the right price. These supercar stuff and everything like that, Probably not. It's only YouTube that's allowed me to be able to do that. It's way too much risk for the reward. Uh, you can, unless you're getting the right buy at the right price, these people, the way these people are making money for rebuilding these supercars and stuff now is they've either got the parts lying around for some reason or another, or they're rebuilding them, they're shipping them abroad and they're, they're taking them abroad. They don't have any crash damage title on abroad and they're selling them for retail value. Like it's the only way people are making money for that now. I, I there may, might be people that are, but I could be wrong. But I can't see it. If you're buying all the parts and doing it properly, there's no way you're making... Got, like I wouldn't be able to make a living out of rebuilding supercars. In that unit, if it wasn't YouTube for YouTube. It. Yeah, there's no way. There's no way. Like, I don't think there's anyone we would have... Like, we probably could have made money, but not enough to pay everyone. That's helping me. So do you think we're ever going to see a Matt Armstrong dealership with a bunch <laughs> no, of cat no. cars in it? No. So Being sold, and they're like, well, that's sound because Matt built it. And it's just yeah, like, yeah, is no. It? <laughs> that's the thing. I, I, I don't... Yeah. I, who everything... buys one? Other than you, who buys a crash damaged car? There's really people better. out there. There's, there is people out there that... Like, because... Like my friend, um, my friend Chris, he's rebuilding the cars. He's not raffling them. He's selling them afterwards. He's still getting really good money for them. But it is a, it is an, an entry into like a supercar, really. Like he just rebuilt an Aston Martin. He made it look like the V12 Aston Martin with a bonnet and everything like that. And it's crash damaged. And he got that at a price of a cheaper Aston Martin V8. But it looks like a V12. It's crash damaged. But no one knows that when you're driving down the street and it, it's an entry into into it. I think they are harder to sell, but there is a market out there for, for things like that. As long as it's been repaired well, and YouTube helps that because people can see exactly what's been repaired, what the damage was. It's when you're buying car, crash damage cars, which you have no idea where the crash was or what's damaged. But yeah, there are people out there. I'd say the, they're going to hold back at like hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of crash damaged cars. But yeah, I think uh, you still your 30, 40, 50 grand. People are still happy to pay it for, a crash damaged car, which is crazy, but yeah, it happens. I mean, I, I think oh, most of mine are crash damaged and I'm still driving them. So <laughs> we're all good. Until the wheel follows you down the road. Yeah, yeah. It takes you, it's all good. That's yeah. it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just imagining the Aston now and that wheel going <laughs> straight fast, full, uh, full steam ahead. Um, now, to run a YouTube channel, like what you've got going now, which is obviously just snowballing down a hill, what kind of team is that currently now taking? You're obviously not just doing one car, how you used to do it on the drive. Yeah, yeah. One project at a time. How many projects do you have on the go? And then what does the YouTube team look like? We've got like a line of cars already ready to go out. Um, so, and the only reason is because we've learned from over the years, when I finish a build and then I'm looking for another one, nothing ever appears. And there's nothing that ever appears up or the right car never appears. It, so now if an opportunity comes up and like a car that I'd want to rebuild appears up somewhere or someone's selling it, we'll go for it straight away and buy it and, uh, and jump to it. But we'll wait for the right time to release the video. If, if we've got like six builds going on the channel at once, everyone's just loses track of what's going on and including myself. But I think the perfect like medium is to have kind of three builds on the channel at a time. And like all different types of cars and all different types of builds. So we have the Ferrari, which is an engine mainly rebuild. But actually, we'll go back. So we had the um, Mercer Largo, which was an engine kind of rebuild, uh, supercar. And then we had the M5, which was more of a bodywork repair structural rebuild. Uh, so more of like a fast daily car. 
then I kind of like a wild card car, which was the GT3. Like that was just like out in America, completely random. Like, and so now we going to try and replicate that as we go through the channel. So we've got the Ferrari, which is an engine rebuild. Have you done an SVI yet? I've not done SVI yet. No, there's no. definitely a few crashed yeah, ones. Yeah, there's out. a lot of them. Yeah, <laughs> we've uh, and then I've got one car that I've just spoken about with the massive rear quarter damage, which we're going to release towards end of this month we have another car which is um going onto the channel next week i don't know when this will go out but this will be th that video will be out next week and that's a car build for a show car build for sema so it's going to be like a uh, like another challenge in itself that's kind of like the wild card car Oh my, it, it's, it's hard. We have like another unit which is like a farm and it's like away oh, so from hang everyone. on, is this the yeah. behind the scenes bit? <laughs> yeah. There's a freaking location no yeah, one knows about. we have another place which is like hidden away where, we, where we'll go from, like everything gets hidden there. Into, like there's a car which is so bad that we have on a trailer at the minute with no suspension, no wheels or anything, which is stuck on my trailer and I can't get it off the trailer until I start it. So I have no trailer anymore, but that one... We're going to start that. That's going to be a Christmas time build. That was like too cheap to ignore. We had to get that car. So, <laughs> And I just mentioned with all those viewers, do you find yourself chasing numbers? Are you doing it because you're just chasing the next build, the next bit uh, of passion? I'm really like hyper-focused on like YouTube side of things, uh, like how to make the videos better and how to, I think like my thing that I've always been like focused on since doing it full time is, I feel like the automotive side of YouTube is too small. Like there's, so you, if you look at like your Mr. Beast kind of things and they're doing like a hundred million views per video and there's not many automotive YouTubers which are doing five to 10 million views per video. You're whistling diesel. He's doing serious amount of views. Every one of them is viral videos and uh, they're, they're doing insane numbers, but I just think that the YouTube side, the rebuilding side, is just a small, it, it's, a, it's too small, really, I think. And like we're doing, okay, 1 million, 1.5 million per video. But when we did the BMW M5, yeah, <laughs> when we did the BMW M5, it did 6 million views. And there's no reason why every single video of mine can't do 6 million views. There's, there's no reason. The only thing I can see is that the Biner car is it appeals to a wider audience because they don't have to understand, like they don't have to understand how a car works for that. It could be entertaining because it's a wider audience watching it. Whereas when we're rebuilding an engine or something like that, it goes a little bit more in depth and you, you're getting more niche. But I just think it can be, I think we're too, I think we're so small of what we can be at the minute. I think at least five to 10, I hope in, I watch this back and Next year, I'm like, yeah, we're going to be doing five to 10 million views per video. And we are because I pictured doing every a million views per video before. It's, and now it's really doing interesting it. you mentioned about Mr. Beast because one, one thing that I listened to him say on a podcast, which really stuck to me, you just think with any business, you've got to think outside the box. And he was yeah. saying about how he had one of his editors changing the way, I don't know if it was the way their mouths worked, but they were changing the language and they yeah. had constructs basically re-speaking it in spanish yeah. so we have a spanish channel as Do well you? i yeah, have no yeah. idea yeah <laughs> yeah so we have a spanish channel as well which uh is we've got a voice actor oh, voice over online. yeah 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 so that one again that's quite new and we're trying to work things out so speaking on the mr beast side of things he's actually got he's stopped all his uh multilingual channels now because he's got access on youtube to a different thing where you can watch your main channel video and select on the settings at the bottom of the video what language you want to watch it in. So when you select that language, all of a sudden you'll start speaking in Portuguese, Arabic, like Mandarin, and it would just be the voice docked over. But only he has access to that at the minute. It's like a beta thing. Oh, or so that is YouTuber that leaving testing. you in a thing that's just like, do I yeah. put effort into this channel or that's is this going to come that's through? That's it. So we're paying for these guys to dock over my videos in Spanish, which is like, way more people are speaking Spanish than like English in the world, if I'm right. And we're uploading it in like Mexico, like changing our location, uploading it there. Some stuff works, some stuff doesn't work. We're trying to understand it a bit more, but we, we it's like, oh, we're building this channel up and then is, everyone's going to have access to this point where you can just swap it on your main channel. It's like, what are we doing? But we're doing it now because we want to be ahead of everyone else. The way we're, 
the, the way we're kind of rolling at the minute, we're thinking, right, Mr. Beast is the big YouTube game like overall, but in the automotive industry, we need to take the reins really and start doing things that other people aren't doing or other people haven't got the budget or the access to. So we're trying to get ahead of the games in so many different ways. Do we start multilingual? Do it, like we started like analyzing so much more stuff that's going into YouTube. Like my Matt, my who started off as my cameraman, who's now become like a brand like ambassador. He's like, one of your team. So we're going to talk about your team. You've got your, your dad's yeah. in there out helping you working on the cars. Everybody's seen Hannah. Yeah, in the yeah. Videos. My dad's in there. Hannah's in there. Um, yeah, my dad's partner has just started working with Hannah doing the merch stuff. And that's pretty much about it. That's Kevin. another part of the business. Of course, there's the online store as well. Yeah, the yeah. So the merch stuff is like another side of it. Hannah takes care of all that. We do it all in-house as well, like all in the unit. We've got all the shelves stacked up with the merch and that type of stuff. Hannah loves doing that. And we like it that we keep it, like a lot of people outsource it, but because we're doing it in-house, it leaves the option to do like loads of personal things. We can write notes in there and we can like um, do special giveaways and it, it helps a lot more. It's so much that. better when you've got hands on with an online store. Yeah. And I can just go upstairs and just get a t-shirt when I need one. <laughs> so, If you had to pick one for the rest of your career, would you choose YouTube AdSense revenue? Or yeah. Or would you choose brand deals? Uh, brand deals. Because YouTube AdSense the money you make from the advertising each month is so up and down, left and right. You don't know what's going to happen. Like you can't predict it. Obviously during Christmas time, it's a lot higher because there's more uh, brands advertising during Christmas time. But during January, when no one's advertising anymore, it it's dropped massively. So you could do double the amount of views you did in December, but earn the same amount you did in December, which is usually the case. We do way more views in January because everyone is at home. No one's got any money left from Christmas. Everyone sits at home. The weather's dull. You're watching YouTube. So we do way more views in January than we do in December because everyone's out and about Christmas time with the family and that sort type of stuff. We earn less, like, well, or the same as what we did in December. So it's, whereas brand deal and pricing, it stays the same for like the whole year or depending on the amount of views you get. You're not discriminated at the time of year so and i've never seen another channel that gets so much. me and charm was talking about this before we come on i've never seen another channel that pretty much every video gets more views than the subscriber base that it's got yeah that's in what the I've automotive always tried to do. yeah we've always tried to do that um which is hard i didn't think it would happen when we got to a million like subscribers i thought oh it's going to be really hard to actually be doing over a million views per video but we've, we've still been able to do it but yeah I still i just still think that automotive channels can do 5 million views plus per video. And I hope, I hope it happens. We're trying to work to make it happen, but there's so many things that playing by YouTube's rules that you have to do to get that. Yeah, we to were make hearing about that video. earlier. So what do you think is the biggest risk posed to you as a YouTuber? Like, I think it, the thing with YouTube is that you can't, there's no um, filter before you post it. It's me, my team, we look at the video, we think, that's great. And then we post it. Uh, but to someone else, it might offend someone. We might say something that's not quite right or something like that. It, like it, whereas with TV, it goes through so many different people before it actually goes live. And I think that's what's killed TV is that it's so corporate. Everything's so kind of filtered and fake that by the time it goes live, which is way after it's been filmed, people are so awake to that. Whereas YouTube is like, I filmed a video just now and three days later it goes live on, on YouTube. So it's like literally real time. But I think the risk is, yeah, saying something that shouldn't be said or offending someone or like now that we're getting loads more views, it has way more impact. So if we're like dissing a company or dissing a brand, then it can really come down on us that we're like, it, it has a massive effect, a challenge effect, though, to, to than, stay loyal to your followers and give them honest advice yeah, yeah. versus keep your channel. That's it. So we were saying like a lot of my, my whole channel is really about cheating the dealers really. Like we're, we're trying to rebuild cars for cheaper than it would be to um, get it done, work done elsewhere. So we're trying to find Lamborghini parts, which, um, which have not come off a Lamborghini. So we found like a Ford Focus indicator fits on a Lamborghini and that type of stuff. I mean, the amount but, of Audi badges on my Purple Mountain. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. So like we found so many things like that. But at what point does the brand step in and go, right, we're opening a lawsuit against you because of 
you have said that this brand is fits this car and we're pricing it differently. Like at what point does that happen? We don't know. We know during Top Gear when Jeremy Clarkson jumped in and he started doing really brutal, honest reviews on cars, the brands were coming in then and saying, right, we want you to do a good review on this car and and otherwise it affects the sales of it. And they're saying, well, we're doing a review regardless. If you want a good review, we need paying for it. Like it's it's a paid advertisement then. It's not a review, it's an advertisement. So there's a difference between that. And I don't want to want it to ever become like corporate and everything I have to be say doctored by someone above me. That's not the reason I've done it. I've done it so I can not have a boss. So I don't really want to be kind of puppeteer. It's amazing how you, how you can reach a peak of that being the case. And yeah, then suddenly yeah. because you're growing, suddenly that not be the case it, and you're at that's it. I think it's so, else. it's so easy to almost sell your soul when the higher you get. There's so many things we could have done. Like brands have offered us like silly money to like do like dedicated videos promoting the brand or they there's so many ways we could have made millions of pounds by doing loads of these brand deals and things that I would never have done. But I think staying true to what we started off doing is why the channel's grown so high. But I, th- I see a lot of people, they get to that point and then they think, oh, brand deal or this amount of money to do this. Yes, I'm going to do it. But you got to think of the lot. It's the long run in YouTube, not these short term cash grabs that you can you can take. But I think it's in every industry, really. You could do it in music or anything. You could almost sell your soul anywhere you go. But so, yeah. so that that long run, as we begin to come to a close, what what lies ahead in the next one to three years? Like I said, we think it's small at the minute and we do think that the views... So you're going to put wagon be- wheels on an SVR, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't actually know for like build-wise, I have no idea. Honestly, we like I'm so far ahead of where I thought I would what ever be. The, what about the business side? So I'd like to be able to employ like more people and, and like more of my family and friends. Like that's what I'd... So like, Interesting. Yeah, like... Everyone I've employed at the minute has all been family, all been friends. I'd like to be able to have most of my family you ever and had friends. That go wrong? Uh, touch wood, not really. No, like everyone who's working is really understands YouTube. My dad had no idea about it, but now he's like really like clocked onto it and he knows how to talk to the camera now. He knows what's worth. He's spent loads of time with us and knows like exactly what the do's and don'ts are and everything. But yeah, it, I, I really like to do more friends and family like employment uh, because then I feel like the, I, I like a workplace where it, it's just feels like you have hanging out, having like a laugh. And that's where we make the be- best content. We did a video going to the Nürburgring the other week, which was meant to be a weekend off. And I was like, let's have a weekend off. Let's go to the Nürburgring. We filmed it on our phone just as a mess around and everyone loved the video. We put it on a second channel. It's done like a million views and we're just messing around filming what we normally do on like a that day is off. Mind such, but it's, it's mental. Everyone was like, I love this video. It's so laid back and chill. And like normally when we go on a road trip, we've got like another car to film like the roller shots. And we're thinking about what we're putting at different points. We just got in the car and just filmed on a phone. And it did it. it did they, bits. People want it real though, don't they? Yeah, they want they the love real it. Yeah, Armstrong. yeah, that's it. That's it. But yeah, sometimes you get too sucked into it all. I think of like the editing and making it as look nice as possible. So we'll finish on some quick fire questions. Yep. What is the one car that if it was crashed and an ability to fix, you would absolutely love to have a go at? Bugatti Veyron, 100%. What, what is the amazing, most amazing place that this YouTube career has taken you? Definitely Florida to Freddie's place in Florida. Yeah, that's opened my eyes up massively, that place. Yeah. And as you've already done, Freddie, because that probably would have been a target or that was an amazing thing. To do. Yeah. Net, if you had to film a video with one other person, not ready, that you'd like to and you haven't, who would it be? I would love to go over to James the Stradman place. I think we'll get on really well. We've got a similar type of history, starting off with an Audi TT, then working through YouTube. And we've got really a lot of things in common. Spoke to him a few times over Instagram. And I think it will happen in the future. Um, but yeah, we've just yet to cross paths. Do you believe you will be the biggest automotive YouTuber in the world? I think so. Yeah, I think so. But we're going up against people like Carwell, which have got a huge engine, but there's no, there's no reason why we can't be. I don't, I can't see why not. Matt Armstrong, legend. Thanks so much. Cheers. It's an absolute pleasure. (laughs) Cheers.